Awesome job this morning. Awesome job this morning. We're going to be in the book of Luke this morning. The book of Luke, chapter 2. Man, y'all got so quiet on me. Good night, breathe. <laughs> no. Luke chapter 2 this morning. We're going to talk about what it should be. What it should be. If y'all would stand with me, I honor reference reading God's Word this morning. What it should be. Luke chapter 2. It says, And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was the first made when Serenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, everyone in his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth under Judea into the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was the house of lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary as his spouse wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came unto them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts, praising God, and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace and goodwill toward men. And it come to pass that the angels were gone away from them into heaven. The shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem, and see this thing which has come to pass which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe laying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And they that all heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all those things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. Dear Heavenly Father God, I just pray you'd hide me behind the cross of Calvary. Speak through me this morning, God. Use me and just fill me with the words you'd have said today. God, that will honor and bring praise and glory to you. Lord, just as on that day you were praised and glorified, we pray that when we leave here today, Lord, we'd be praising and glorifying you in the way that you deserve to be. We love you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. We went to some of our friends' house uh, yesterday evening, and when we got home last night, as uh, is her... Um, normal thing to do. My wife will get all my clothes together, you know, my jacket and my, my pants and all that stuff and get it all ironed and laid out for me. She does that on Saturdays. And, I mean, I've been just kind of hopping around all weekend feeling good. You know, I've been sick for a couple of weeks and got to feeling better. I've been aggravating everybody, you know, doing all kind of stuff and um, <laughs> just uh, laughing, had a good time all weekend. And then when we got home, she told me, she said, what's wrong? You know, she said, what's wrong? I said, well, I said, it's like God had just flipped the switch. And she said, what you mean? I said, well, when he flipped the switch, I said, there ain't no turning it off. And she said, what you mean by that? I said, well, it's just time, man. And I started thinking about, you know, I've been studying all week and getting ready to be able to preach this morning and had on my mind what God is speaking through my heart today. And um, it just kind of got a hold of me, you know. And as I went to bed last night and when I woke up this morning, it's been on my mind and it's been on my heart. So if y'all need to, sometimes through this, you just kind of bear with me. But um, really talking about something today that we should talk about this time of year and that we shouldn't just talk about on Christmas Day, but we should talk about when this month begins and when things get started. And, uh, you know, it, it's kind of like my dad told me when he talked about how I should use something. I got a truck, my first truck, it was an 85 F-150 four-wheel drive. And um, my dad told me, you know, he said, now listen, that four-wheel drive ain't meant to go play in like you're going to want to do. He said, that four-wheel drive is meant to get you out of trouble. He said, you just leave it in two-wheel drive, and then when you get stuck, you lock it in four-wheel drive when you start getting close to getting stuck, and you back out of where you went into. He said, you'll be all right. He said, it'll get you out of that hole. Well, you know what? I didn't always do that. I didn't always listen. As a matter of fact, the first night I drove it, 
and took it somewhere. I got it stuck so bad we had to wait till the next day to get it out. And Daddy wasn't very happy. <laughs> but, you know, when I used it like he's taught, taught me to use it, all the rest of my days and having trucks I've had, it's always worked out. You know, and that's not always a guarantee with that situation. But it's kind of like with Christmas, man, and celebrating the birth of our Savior. When it's what it should be, my goodness, it helps you in so many ways. And when we, we use it like it should be used this time of year, you know, it keeps us from getting into trouble. It keeps us from uh, being about things and doing things that we shouldn't be doing. It helps us in life. It uplifts us. It encourages us. It does all kind of great things when we use this time of year and we use the celebration of our Savior in the right way. And so I want to kind of talk about that this morning. And here in Luke, you had the account of when the shepherds came and when Christ was born. And I just want to talk about three things, three simple things this morning that it should be. You know, when you talk about what Christmas should be, the first thing I think it should be is a time of celebration. A time of celebration. We look at verses 8 through 10, and it says, And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And it says, Lo, the angel of the Lord came unto them, and the glory of the Lord shone about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. And listen to this now. It says in verse 15, And it come to pass, as the angels were gone away from in the heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even to Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass. Man, they were ready to go. They were ready to see what the angels had sang about and had told them about because it was a time of celebration. It was something they had waited for for a long time. It's something they were looking for for a long time. And so when we come to this time of year, and, and you know you can argue a lot of things about Christmas, and people do. Good theologians argue about a lot of things about Christmas. You know, really, there, there's good proof that by the way the shepherds were here and other things that transpired around the birth of Christ that it may have been in the summertime when he was born. Now, let me, just let me tell you something. If you want to look at if you want to look at Christmas right, it needs to be a time of celebration. But when you look at the definition of celebration, it can help you to understand and get past some of those things that people argue about about Christmas about all the little details that people get into. Listen to this now. Here's the first definition. There's two of them to choose from. Whenever I looked up uh, celebration, there were two of them to choose from. Here's the first one. And here's the one that I believe that most people think about and what most people do when they think about celebrating Christ's birth. Now listen to this. It says a party or a special event at which you celebrate something such as a birthday or a religious holiday. That couldn't define any better what most people do at Christmas. They celebrate the birthday of Jesus, you know. They celebrate the time he was born. It also says a religious holiday. That's what it is to a lot of people is a religious holiday. A time when, you know, people that are religious celebrate a religious holiday. And, uh, you know, that's the definition for it. But that ain't the one that we need to use as Christians. And that ain't the one that will help you in the way that I'm talking about this morning. There's a second one. It says on an occasion when you show admiration of someone. It's an occasion when you show admiration for someone. See, Christmas ain't about a day. It's about a person. It's a celebration, man, not of just a day. It's a celebration. When you do it right, you celebrate the person of Jesus Christ. Man, there was angels singing that day to those shepherds. That ain't what made it special to them. Can you imagine the lights, man, the glory of God? Can you imagine the light display that they seen that night out there with them sheep? It wasn't about that that made it special to them. That ain't what they went just telling everybody about. You know what made it special to them? Him. Man, Him. It's an occasion when you show adoration of someone. Man, you'll always do Christmas right when you use it as an occasion to show your admiration, your love for Jesus Christ, the person. You celebrate Him. You're going to do it the right way. You'll have the right motive. You'll do the right thing. It'll be what it should be. It'll mean a whole lot more to you. I mean, and I'm not some ball humbug dude. I'm not a guy who's up here 
I, I tell you things I love. I love Christmas trees. You know, people argue about where they come from or whatever. I tell you what it means to me. I think about the cross when I think about that tree. Now, I don't know what it means to some people. And that's all right. They can do what they want to do. But I love Christmas trees. I love how pretty they are. I had a whole lot of fun with my family going to pick it out this year. We hadn't ever done a live tree and done that, but that was fun. I love the lights. Man, most of the time when you drive around in the wintertime, it's dark and dreary. If it weren't for all them pretty Christmas lights everybody's got, somehow it just brightens your day. Man, I love hot chocolate. I love hot chocolate. I love fruitcake. I even love being around my fruity family sometimes. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I'm not some bah humbug guy who, you know, all against the things we do. But I'm telling you, if it's what it should be, it'll be a celebration of him and who he is. Now you think about that. You think about it. If that's what you've been doing, and that's what you've been looking forward to, and you've been doing it right, and you've been using it the way it should be this time of year, this time, this celebration that we got. But if not, man, you're missing out. You're missing out. I'm telling you. It's a time of celebration. You hear what I'm saying? God didn't intend this to be some time where everybody sit around whining and crying. God didn't intend this for a, a time for people sitting around moaning and groaning. You know what God intended this to be? A celebration. And it should be a celebration. You know what you do at a celebration? You have fun. You have fun. And I'm telling you, when it's what it should be, you'll have fun. Now, when it gets to be at about the schedule and getting all the stuff just right and making everybody happy, it ain't going to work out for you. I can tell you one thing. You ain't going to make everybody happy. And when you try to make everybody happy, you ain't going to make nobody happy. You hear what I'm saying? But I'm telling you today, when you do it right, and it's what it should be, it'll help you. It'll uplift you. But not only should it be a time of celebration, but it should be a time of adoration. Now listen to verses 15 and 16. It says, And it came to pass that the angels were going away from them in heaven. The shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and a babe lying in a manger. Man. Adoration is a feeling of deep love. And listen to this. This right here, this right here says it all. This, this says it all about it's a time of adoration. The noun adoration comes from the Latin word. Listen to this now. I'm, I'm just not uh, all into all that kind of stuff. I like just preaching straight, just talking in, in normal terms. But I, I want to tell you this definition. I want to tell you where this word adoration comes from, what it was derived from in the Latin language. It's adoration. It means to worship. The word adoration is derived from the word, the Latin word that means to worship. When, it, when it's talking about we should adore Christ, when you say we should look at him in adoration, it's because he's deity. It's because he's God. It's because he's worthy of our worship. And I'm telling you, man, the definition of adore is this. It's a verb. Adoration, like I said, is worship, but adore is a verb. It's something you do. It means to worship or honor as deity or as divine. That's one of the things it means. So when you adore Christ, you worship him as, de as deity and divine. When you say you adore him, when you say it's a time of adoration, it means it's a time of worship and a time you bow before him. Now listen, there's some synonyms that go along with this word. You, you just would never know I, didn't, I hated English class, did you? But listen to these synonyms. And there were some other definitions of adore that you could use when you were talking about your wife, your kids, you know, things like that. Listen to this. Here's some synonyms. To love dearly, to love, to be devoted to, to dote on, to hold dear, to cherish, to treasure, to prize, to think the world of. You know, there's some other dates that I love. Now, they don't compare to the birth of Christ. They don't compare to the day I was saved. They don't. But there's some other dates I love. One of the dates I love is August 8th. 
19 something. I ain't telling that part. There's another date I love. August 26, 1999. There's another day I love that I just adore. And that is December 26, 2000. You say, well, what are those dates? Well, August 8th is my bride's birthday. Now, that day didn't mean a hill of beans to me when I was coming up. But I adore that day because I adore that woman. I remember when I first seen her walk across the commons there at Pierce County High School. I have adored her ever since. I have adored her. See, some of y'all people wonder where all that love stuff come from on Facebook I put. Well, I, it come from the sermon. So you, you ladies want your husband to be lovesick, just get into preaching, amen? You ought to get him on the right track. But listen to me. You me tell you why I adore her? Because of what she means to me. When most women would have had their bag and walking out the door, she had her Bible in her hand and she asked me to go to church. And when she said those vows and she said through good and bad, she meant it. She meant it. So I love that day because I adore that woman. I adore that woman. And then God blessed me with another great day. On August 26th in 1999, I've seen the most perfect little thing I've ever seen. And she's still just as perfect. She, I know she's got flaws, but I can't see them. Mary Catherine Carter was for me. And I got to hold her in my hand. And I love that day. I celebrate that day. Not because of the day. Not because of the cake or the ice cream. Because I adore that little girl. I mean, by the time she was 10 years old, she knew every pin number on my cards. <laughs> she not only had the strings of my heart, she, owned, she had the weight of my checkbook, amen? She could get anything she wanted. And all she had to do was look. And then there's another very special day. December 26th in 2000. When a big old blue-eyed little boy, I mean, he had the biggest blue eyes. I knew from the day he was born, there was going to be women chasing him the rest of his life. <laughs> but more than that, he is such a strong, strong young man. And God is so strong in him. I don't know if he'll end up teaching Sunday school or preaching or being a deacon or what God will use him to do. But I know God's strong in him. And I adore and I love that day. Because on that day, God gave me a great, great gift. A great gift. You understand what I'm saying when I say it's a time of adoration? It's a time when you look at that day and you love that day, but not because of that day and all the little things that went on around it, but because of the person that you're adoring that day, the things you remember that day. See, not only is it a time of celebration and adoration, but it's a time of, of salvation. He said it, man. He said it right there in verse 11. Look down at verse 11 and see what it says. It says, For unto you is born this day in the city of David, Savior, which is Christ the Lord. See, I, I believe that the nation of Israel wasn't as far as some people think from accepting Christ. I believe they would have accepted Christ as Savior. I believe they wanted somebody to come in and swoop in and, and take the Romans' rule away from them. Man, whenever he come in a triumphal entry and he came into Jerusalem, I believe when they were crying and, and saying, Hosanna, and, 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 and saying all the beautiful things about him, I believe they meant it. They were waiting for a Savior. 
and they wanted him to save them. But the problem they had was the bottom part of this verse, which is Christ the Lord. They didn't want to humble themselves in the sight of the Lord. They accepted him, you know, as a Savior. They said, man, save us. We want to be saved. But when he demanded lordship, they didn't do that. Seemed to me, man, I, I'm just being honest with you, uh, lordship is really just not an issue. And this is what I mean by that. It's, it's not like that lordship is not a truth from God's word that I teach and I try to explain to people and I try to encourage people to humble themselves and, and place themselves under the lordship of Christ. It's just that personally, it's not an issue anymore. Because I, I, I think about what Paul said when Paul said, and I may not quote this word for word, but he said that, that he was willing and wanted to endure the suffering if he had to, to know the fellowship of Christ, to know Christ better, to understand him better to understand his love, to understand his compassion, to understand him better. He was willing to go through the suffering to get to that because he wanted that knowledge. And see, here's the thing today, man. Here's the thing is, lordship is not an issue. When you see what God has done for you, you're not worried about what God tells you to do. Because when you think about what God has done for you. See, I went into that church that day. The first time I went and my wife asked me, I went to that church that day because I knew I needed her. And she had told me if I didn't quit drinking, if I come in drunk again, if I went to the bar again, if I didn't quit doing all those things, I was doing. And she was leaving. So when I first went into church with her, I went because I knew I needed her. But when I went in there, what I discovered was through the preaching of God's word and the faithfulness of God's man was that I was a sinner. And if you had asked me before then, I would not have denied I was a sinner. I knew I was a sinner. But there was a realization that went on that day. I don't know exactly how, what, or I can't explain it all to you. But those of you who have been there, you know what I'm saying. When you've seen how pure and beautiful God was, and then you looked at all you'd done in your life, you knew you needed a Savior, and that you were a sinner. See, I went in there knowing I needed her, but I came out knowing I needed a Savior. And in a couple of weeks when I come and give my life to God, I prayed this, and I prayed this this morning, not for salvation this morning, but I don't know about you, but in James it says to humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he'll lift you up. I realize that I not only need to humble myself so that God will lift me up, but I need to humble myself every day so that I can stay in that place God wants me to be to show his humility and his love. Because when he lifts me up, I had the most trouble staying humble. So I not only need God's help initially to bow before him and humble myself so that he'll initially lift me up, but I need God's help when I'm lifted up by him and used by him to stay humble. But I prayed that day and I said, God, would you please forgive me? And man, when I, I said, God, forgive me, I was thinking about all my sins. And man, you don't know what all I've done. You don't know what all I've done. My wife will never know all that I've ever done. My kids, thank God, will never know all that I've done. But God, in His omniscience, knew everything I'd done. Everything. And I said, God, forgive me for what I've done. And really and truly, standing there, kneeling there, I didn't know how he could forgive me for what I'd done. I still don't know why he came and laid in a manger. That baffles me. But man, when you get to Calvary, there's a 
There's no way to understand it. Why he took that beating like he did. I remember when I was studying about the crucifixion of God and trying to learn some more things about it. It talked about in there when they were describing what they'd done to him that they took him after they beat him. They put his clothes back on him. And they let, they let the clothes dry and mesh in his wound. And as the blood dried, you've been cut before, as the blood dried in the wound, the clothes were dried and stuck to it. And then they took and they ripped it. Ripped it off of it. When I just think about that, I think, my God, how could you do that? And then the reason he done it was to forgive me. That's why I don't understand sometimes why people have such a hard time letting go and just letting God do what he wants to. I just believe in my heart there ain't a thing I could do to ever pay him. I could never do enough. Anything he wants from me will never be enough. And I want to give it. I ain't perfect at it, but I want to give it. Because it pleases him. Now why it pleases him to have me and to, to use me and to love me, I don't know. But I just believe the Bible and I know it pleases him. So the Lordship thing just is not as much of an issue this morning for you. If you really take and you look through the eyes of God at what He's done and who you are. And I'm telling you today that not only is it a time of celebration, when we should celebrate Christ's coming and a time of adoration, when we should adore Him. But it's also a time of salvation. That God came in the flesh to bring salvation to all men. And man, He wants to save you today. And I'm telling you, it ain't that He don't care what you've done. It's that He knows what you've done. And He can love you anyway because of what His Son done. So you need to come today if you've never been saved. But I'm going to tell you something else. Not only do people need to come to be saved today, there's some people in here. You, you know you ain't been doing this right. You know what I had to do when I prayed this morning? I had to pray and I had to say, God, forgive me for the days 